And I'm live. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm going to give it a few seconds. Hello, hello. Um, super hot in New York City today. Um, I have the AC on in the background. I don't know if that's going to be a problem. If you guys who are here early could just let me know, is it loud? Is it something I should turn off? We've all seen me sweaty before. It's not going to be anything that's a problem. So, uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello. So, um, welcome to another installment of Geek Speaks Greek. Um, this is a little bit of a, for lack of a better term, a little bit of a catch-up episode. Um, you know, as we, as you know, I took uh, most of last week off. I went dark uh, in order to give time for some thought and for listening to other voices. And um, a lot of stuff has accumulated during that time. Uh, a lot of art. I'm going to show a lot of art today. Even still, I'm not going to get through everything. You guys are like the best fans in the world. Um, and just going to answer a lot of questions. Some people have sent me in questions. I'm also going to have people taking questions here. But um, <clears throat> hi, welcome to Geek Speaks Greek. I am your geek, George O'Connor. Clearly speaking English, the Greek I'm talking about in this instance is Greek mythology. Normally, each episode of Geek Speaks Greek, I talk about a different persona of Greek mythology, be they goddess, god, hero, or monster. Today, who knows who we'll be talking about? Probably a lot of different gods, because it's going to be about your Q&A. But before I get into that, like I said, there's a ton of artwork from people that have been sending in to share. So I'm going to start doing that. A lot of this artwork is going to be pretty Zeus heavy because the last two episodes that we did were, of course, about Zeus. But uh, first, there's a picture of Iris. This is by Drake. We've gotten a lot of stuff from Nora and Drake before in the past. Uh, apparently, they missed an episode. Ooh, uh, they were very mad at their mom, but they've sent it in now. So there's a bit of things we're going to show here. That was Drake's Iris, which is beautiful. Drake is one of the young artists who's been saying stuff who's gotten better and better. And then this one is really cool by his sister, Nora. Now, right in the center, we have Hera. There is Iris, the messenger. And then, like, this is the part I love about this painting. Look at Hebe. Hebe, the cupbearer of the gods, daughter of Hera, whose job is to serve drinks. Looks like she's serving her mom wine. And if you look closely, you can see she's got her tongue out. I think Hebe's been stealing a little bit of her mom's drink, which is pretty funny. The idea of, like, Hebe, like, stumbling around Mount Olympus all drunk. Now, this is a bit of a darker picture, but it's certainly in keeping with Greek mythology. This is Kronos eating, I think it's baby Hestia, but it might be baby Hades. Kind of looks like baby Hades. And Rhea looking on all sad, being like, oh, don't eat my kids. I mean, of course, we know eventually the kids are vomited up. Um, here we have, uh, here's some more. I think this is the Titans. I'm not sure. I think that's Rhea holding the baby. I should look this one up. Uh, this is awesome. This is the whole original first gen. This is also by uh, Nora. This is the whole original first generation Olympians, right? We have Hestia, Demeter, Zeus. You can see he's even got his Aegis on there. Poseidon, Hades. And wait, is that Hera holding hands with Hades? Is this an alternate idea? I don't know. I kind of like that. We've talked how that they might be a better couple. Or maybe it's just that their hands are overlapping. Um, here we have... Another Hera, this with her peacock. There's Helios the sun looking over. Man, Nora, you're getting to be quite the young artist. And now this is super cool. Like, this is a very hera centric Remember we talked about how the goddesses and gods didn't... Not all... Okay, when Zeus freed the Olympians, um, he got lightning... I'm not... When Zeus, start over. When Zeus freed the Cyclopes, he got electricity as a power. Poseidon got the earthquake-causing trident. Hades got the helmet of invisibility. Demeter got the cryosaur, the golden blade. But, like, what did Hera and Hestia get? And I posited, well, Hestia probably didn't need anything because she actually has fire. You know, she's literally on fire, so why not? And I said, maybe Hera did something cool with air or something. Nora designed, check this out, because one of Hera's symbols is a diadem, a crown. She has a crown that shoots metal spikes off when you get close. So this picture that you're in a battle and she's just sitting there looking all like queenly and they're like, get her! And she's like, oh, hello, do you like my cloud? And like these things shoot off and like stab everybody. I like it. It's kind of evil. And then this is another shot to close this out by Drake. Um, Drake apparently is a big fan of spaceships. I wonder why. Probably because we've had that recent launch and space shuttles. So this is Zeus surrounded by astronauts and spaceships and things. I like that idea. That actually ties in... Um, so have you ever seen that Star Trek episode, Who Mourns for Adonis, where like the Starship Enterprise is literally captured by Apollo? It's my favorite episode. Somebody actually mentioned in the comments is one of my questions. Who mourns for Adonis? Uh, nobody. 
Turns out Apollo's still alive and he's a jerk that kidnaps spaceships. But <laughs> um, let's go through some more art, if we may. Um, mm -mm -mm. That one was called, uh, oh, here. This is from Eleanor. Eleanor is another one of her young artists who always sends in something. This is Zeus, and he's surrounded, again, we're talking about those weapons, the Cyclopes gifted weapons. Look at that. You can see the trident, you can see the lightning bolt, you can see the helmet, all of it surrounding Zeus. Eleanor, I love that you draw this. This just makes me so happy. Um, let's see what else we have here. There's really so much. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a little bit of a problem for me to get catch up and everything. We have to do more of these. Um, all right, so, uh, oh, wait, I skipped one. Now, um, I almost feel like I've shown this one before, but I don't know when. I think I just looked at it so long that I got excited. This is Yehi. Yehi writes to us from Korea. She's an amazing artist. She did this piece, which is a shot of Zeus at all his different ages. So here we have baby Zeus, one of the Kuritis, the nymphs that held him as a child, and there's Almathea, the goat with this mystic horns that suckled him. Look at the little fat little baby Zeus, look all fat. And then there's like young Zeus with his kind of like blondish light brown hair and he's running. Then there's Storm Zeus. Remember how I said how originally Zeus was going to have black hair, which I so wish I couldn't do, but like, yeah, he does perfectly. And then here's like modern Zeus. He's just kind of staying there. He doesn't have his Aegis anymore because he's given it to his daughter Athena. This is great. It's like the four stages of Zeus. I love this picture so much. Um, then, I normally, like, yeah, he does really clever comics, right? And this is one, I'm just gonna kinda talk you through. I'm gonna definitely post this up on my website because I really think this one is really funny. Apollo is the god of prognostication. He could tell the future, right? It's, he's an oracle. And we had talked about, like, in one of the episodes last week, or maybe the week before even, like, did Zeus kind of rig the system when he divided the cosmos? You know, they supposedly drew lots, he and his brothers, over who got the sky, who got the ocean, and who got the surface of the, uh, I mean, the underground. And this is Apollo having a vision where it all turns out different, right? It's, I, I guess I won't talk to you, I'm just gonna post this up. It's so clever, and it's like such a great version uh, of like all the different stuff. Like, And the funniest thing is if Zeus, like, look at him there. Now he's the, he's, or it says, Hera gets to see Zeus is like, I'm the hot electricity at your home. And then these little people are like, electricity gives us light and heat, even music in the radio. And then Apollo's like, wait, what is that? I don't know what that stuff is. But then Demeter's like, people never get a chance to like, because of this, they never get a chance for electricity. And like, there's no Korean barbecue. And, and then like, a, Apollo's like, I like the original version better. And it's just, it's super clear. I'm going to post the whole thing up because I'm doing a terrible job explaining it. Uh, my cat's just knocked over something. It wouldn't be an episode of Geek Speaks Greek without my cats going nuts and destroying my house. Um, it's fun to have cats, guys, especially when you have three. Uh, let's see what else we got. Okay, this is something I got just a little while ago. I'm skipping ahead. Um, this is from the Gilmore Matthews family, who are writing me all the way from Alaska. Uh, this is the first time I've heard from them, that I'm aware of. And there is two. There is Gus and Opal. And Opal's a little bit older, and Gus is a younger guy, and Gus has been spending his, uh, his time stuck at home during the quarantine. He's been dressing up as various gods and goddesses. This is a picture of him. I think this is him as Athena, if I recall. And then this is a shot. Wait till you see this one. This one is great. <laughs> now, he didn't actually have a trident around his house. There's Gus as Poseidon. Look, he's got the flowery shirt on even. I love it. It's so cool. And then his sister, who, like I said, is a little bit older, Opal, she apparently has done tons of portraits of the gods. Uh, I was only sent a few, but I'm going to share them with you now. Look at this Hades. I mean, it, the name is backwards. You can see. Look at the face. Look at the textures. This is so great. And then, uh, let's see, next one. Here's a Poseidon. Look at this amazing Poseidon. I love this. Surrounded by fish. <laughs> Smiley little fish, like the ones I draw. Look at the Apollo. Surrounded by musical notes. I love it. Like, she made, like, these frames every time. And then, look at Zeus just shooting electricity off. I love it. These are so great. And from what I hear, there's a bunch more. So I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that we get to see more from Opal and Gus. Because that is some cool, cool stuff. Um, let's see. Uh... 
Man, I have so much art to show, and I don't want to talk... Like, I've already been talking a while showing this stuff. Um, let me see. Let me see. Oh, this is a cool one. I want to show this one. This is from Moira. She just drew an Athena. See the owl up in the tree? And it's. I like that she's just... I love the ones where she's actually in a setting, which is kind of cool. You know, and there she's just sitting there next to the tree. I love this. What a beautiful, like, just gentle drawing. My cats are fighting right now. Can you guys hear that? I don't know. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, that's something that I have to do for later. <laughs> this is funny. Now, this is from, uh, oops, I hit the wrong one. Oh, suddenly the pictures aren't really popping up. Okay. Let's just do one more and then I'm going to go into questions. How's that sound? Uh... Oh, here it is. I liked this one a lot. This is a Kronos, which like, very cool. And if you look very closely in there, you could see the original six, well, the original five Olympians. Zeus hasn't been swallowed yet. That is from, that's also from Moira. Oh, see this, I, man, I have so much stuff. I was trying to only do one of each person because so much stuff built up. <sighs> There's a lot. I'm gonna have to make like a file or something, a folder. Cause guys, thank you so much for sending stuff in. I wanna move this to taking some Q and A's. And also there was a lot of questions people wrote to me in advance, so I'm gonna kind of start off with that. Uh, if you have any questions or artwork or poems or anything you wanna to send to me, please send it, as usual, to my email, georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. Uh, if you wanna catch another episode that you've missed or rewatch one or just whatever, all these are archived on my YouTube, youtube.com slash user slash George Olympians. I guess they're saved on my Instagram now. Instagram stories is suddenly, IGTV is suddenly a thing. Now, uh, bear with me, please, as I find these questions. This was sent to me uh, by two listeners, whose names I forgot. They actually have formed a Greek mythology. This is uh, their mom, I could tell you. Her name is Jamie. So if, if your mom's named Jamie, listen in, because like, they are forming a little book club where they watch these episodes and they read the books and they formed a few questions. And I figured while I'm giving people a chance to write their own questions in, I would start by answering these questions. The first question they ask is, will there be books for Hestia, Hephaestus, Dionysus, Eris, Eros, Cori, Persephone, Demeter? Uh, I see something Leto. Uranos, Gaia, Rhea, Kronos, the Muses, the Hecatonchres, the Cyclopes, Metis, Medusa, Echidna, Typhon, Th Theseus, bleh, Heracles, and Argus Panoptus. Whew. Okay, that's quite a list of, of names there. So some of them, I mean, Hef Hephaestus actually has a book out. Maybe, if that's the most recent one, so maybe you just haven't seen it yet. So you could go to a library. Well, you can't go to a library right now, probably, unless you're in an area where they've opened those. But you could, like, order it online or you could take it out digitally probably from libraries. Hephaestus has his own book. Dionysus, I'm working on that right now. I literally have pages inside. I'm gonna do an episode soon where I show you guys some of the artwork from Dionysus because it's coming out really good. I'm really happy with it. Um, Kore slash Persephone and Demeter, they kind of already have the book. It's Hades. It's really, if you look at that, there's more in there about Persephone than there is about Hades. There's more about there in Demeter than Hades. It came down to a marketing decision. We called it Hades because God of the Dead's just gonna sell a lot of copies. A lot of the other characters that you mentioned have been covered in other books. Like, like Medusa is covered in Athena for the most part. Heracles is covered in Hera. Sometimes I try to cover the stories and other, like if, whichever Olympian they're most related to. The plan is eventually. I would love to come back after I do my Asgardian series, which will be a four book series about Norse mythology. I'm gonna come back and do more stories about more minor gods and goddesses. So you will see some stuff about some of these characters you asked for. Oh, and Hestia, by the way, she's the narrator of Dionysus. So she's getting a lot of play in that. So it's kind of her book too. The second question they asked is why did you write this series? And there's a lot of reasons about this series. Like Greek mythology is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, but uh, basically, the, like the short and sweet answer, because I don't want to go too long in this, uh, Olympians is the series that when I was a kid reading Greek mythology that I wanted to read, and nobody had made it yet. So now that I've grown up and I still love Greek mythology more than anything, now I am making the series that I wanted to read. It's still the series I want to read. And that's the great thing about writing and drawing, is if you want to find a certain type of story and it turns out that story doesn't exist, 
you can make it yourself. It's, this is why I have like the best job in the world, at least for someone like me. Now this one's a tricky question. Uh, are the stories all fiction or myths? Now that's interesting. Depends on how you view myths. Some people believe in the myths. Um, I certainly put my own spin on them. Did these stories ever happen exactly like this? I'm honestly, I'm a big believer in science. I don't think that the earth was, you know, I don't think that the earth created everything else. I think the earth is part of the cosmos. But I think there are certain truths to these stories. Are the gods real? That's hard to say. If enough people believe in something, sometimes, I don't know. I think I've told before, I had a, I've had a couple weird experiences that make me like, huh, are the gods real? I don't know. I like to think, maybe. It'd be pretty cool, right? Um, did I make up the dialogue? Yes, for the most part, when the gods are speaking something, that's something that I wrote myself. A lot of times there's little nods to the original stories. I might use a phrase or something specifically that's a little bit of a hint that unless you really knew the story, you wouldn't get what I'm doing that. But for the most part, when I'm writing the characters, the gods and goddesses, heroes and monsters, because they all have such human elements, I try to varying degrees make them speak like human. The more familiar gods, the ones who are more like people, like say Hermes, he speaks very modern, like a normal person almost, maybe a little bit silly. But then gods who are a little bit more stuffed and important, and maybe even older, like Poseidon, Poseidon speaks in a very lofty way. And it's different, you have hints about their personality and the way that I write their dialogue. Um, how did I learn about Greek mythology? Initially I learned about Greek mythology in school. I was um, in third grade. I've told this story I think elsewhere, so I won't get into it too much, but we did, a, we studied Greek mythology, and um, I was a kid who loved drawing monsters and muscle men for the monsters to eat, and it changed my life. It was like the coolest stories I ever learned. And then I just read a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot on my own. Um, we are seven and nine years old. Did you like Greek mythology when you were our age? All right, someone help me out here. Third grade, how old would I have been? I would have been like eight or nine, right? Yeah, so maybe even seven? I don't know, I'm bad at this, yes. I did like Greek mythology when it was your guys' age. And um, the final question, and then I'll start taking questions people have here. Our favorite gods and goddesses are Artemis and Hermes. Who is your favorite god or goddess? Um, Hermes is my favorite god. Hera's my favorite goddess. Heracles is my favorite hero. And Typhon is my favorite monster. I hope that was helpful. Now let's see. Let's go through these questions. I'll zoom up a little bit so I can get... Oh, this is a fun one. Are Ares and Eris related? They have similar names. Isn't that funny how close their names are and they do have a bit of an overlap? So for most genealogies, they are not actually related. I think it, it might actually be Homer, you know, the guy who is credited with writing the Iliad and the Odyssey, who refers to them, uh, I think has Ares referred to Eris as his sister. Most genealogies of the gods have her coming from an alternate line of gods. Um, she's descended, she's Nyx. We talk, go watch the Nyx episode. There's some cool stuff in that one. Nyx is the goddess of night. And so she's from a different familial line. But because she is the goddess, Eris is the goddess of causing trouble. And Ares is the god of bloodthirsty war. They have a kinship. They get along really well. So like some of us will have a best friend or like somebody in our life who is so close that we think of them as a brother or a sister. That's how Ares views Eris. And the fact that their names sound similar is just a weird connection. There's Ares, Eris, Eros. There's a lot of names that sound kind of similar. It's pretty funny. Um, okay, so what else do we have here? Oh, who are you doing today? Missed the beginning. Uh, today's just a general Q and O. Oh man, Q and A. I'm just kind of talking about whoever anybody asks about. Um, yeah, he asks two questions in a row, so I'll ask them both. What program do you use to color the book? And will Asgardians be an all ages friendly book too? Yes, Asgardians is the four book series which will be following Olympians, and it will be very similar. The artwork's gonna be a little bit dirtier and uglier because Olymp Asgardians are dirtier and uglier than Olympians. But it's gonna be the same idea where um, adults will read it and kids will read it and there's stuff written at different levels and if it's something that's inappropriate, I'll do it in a way that a little kid won't even realize it. So now the little kid's like, wait, he's doing inappropriate stuff? But it's gonna be written the same way where it'll be an all ages book. It'll be a companion. Ideally, people will have the two books together, the two series together on their shelf as part of their, you know, George O'Connor does myths library. As far as which program I use to color the books, 
Um, so I think I've said this before. When I'm actually drawing the books, I actually draw them by hand. Like I actually dip a pen in ink and draw on paper. I scan that into the computer and I use um, Adobe Photoshop to color it. Although recently, very recently, I've switched over from using Adobe Photoshop to using Clip Studio, which used to be called Manga Studio. Um, it's been my favorite program. I do some digital drawing in it too. It's really, like that picture of Zeus I drew the other day where he was like this and he was like electrocuting. Like that was something I just did, I doodled in uh, Manga Studio, or Clip Studio. It's a really great program. So that's the ones I use to color it. Uh, if you were a demigod, this is from Astraos 19, or descended from one, who do you think would be your divine ancestor? <laughs> I think I've talked about this before. Like, I would love to say I'm, I'm Hermes, but no, nah, man, I'm not cool enough. But I would have Hermes in my line. I'm pretty sure I'd be descended from Pan. You know, goat god. I mean, sometimes I wear horns. I look kind of like Pan. I'm like this, eh. Um, I'd probably be Pan. So I would have, like, Hermes as my grandpa and Zeus as my great-great-grandpa. That would be ideal. I could see Eris being related to me if she ever had kids. That would make sense, too. Um, it wouldn't be... <laughs> definitely not... I wouldn't be right off of Hermes, though. There has to be a little bit of celebration there. Um, somebody has a suggestion, which is an interesting one. Oh, CVQ Lama. Just named the Dionysus book, The Tales of Hestia and Dionysus. That would definitely be a departure from how we've done the series before. And I'll tell you actually this, CVQ Lama. My publisher has made it... There's been times I've suggested book titles that don't have the god's name as the first word, and they've always shot it down. They think it's very important that we, because I, for instance, I wanted to call the Hera book, it was going to be called The Glory of Hera, which is both about Hera and a translation of the name of Heracles. And they said, no, you have to have Hera's name first. And so we end up doing Hera, the goddess in her glory, which is good. It's not as great as Glory of Hera, honestly. So I don't think they would let me get away with saying it's like that title, the, um, the Tales of Hestia and Dionysus, just because um, it doesn't, it would have to be, it would have to be Dionysus and the Tale of Hestia too. And that would be stinky. I don't know. Uh, how long does it take to thoroughly research each book? That's from Alicia Sophia. That's a great question because it really, it really depends. Um, I think I've mentioned this before. I think I, I think I've said, I think I've mentioned this before a lot today, right? But when I'm researching a book, the thing about Greek mythology, even though these stories are thousands of years old and there really haven't been new original myths written for thousands of years, right? Like, there's so many that have survived, that exist, that you could almost kind of keep going down. Like, you almost never hit the bottom. I'm always discovering new stories. So sometimes, this actually just happened with Dionysus. I've had Dionysus written for quite a while, um, and I've been drawing finishes, and there's a scene later in the book that I rewrote because I found another myth that I liked better. So I say normally I take between three to six months of just reading and taking notes. But I keep doing that even while I'm working on the books because ideas will keep changing as I'm working on the books. It's, you know, some people don't like the idea of research. Uh, they're like, ugh. But research for me is the most exciting part because it's just, it's me giving my brain food for ideas that I will create later. Does that make sense? Renka says, I love your books. Thank you, Renka. Uh, <laughs> T. Mackie, let's look, let's talk looks. Your Zeus is very handsome, as is Apollo and Hermes. But you said Ares is supposed to be the most handsome. Why is this? Well, ah, there's actually, I, I'm not gonna be able to pull the textual reference, but there is actually an ancient text where it says Ares, the most handsome of the gods. And I guess it comes down to our specific interpretations of that word. Cause yeah, I mean, I guess for my own personal tastes, uh, Ares is maybe not the handsomest. Like I do think that like say Zeus is probably better looking, but I think what I tried doing with Ares, I interpreted handsome as um, like, okay, I've said this before. Oh, there you go again. Like Apollo is maybe the most beautiful, but Ares is handsome. So I interpreted the word handsome to mean a certain type of attractiveness, a certain very masculine and rugged uh, handsomeness. If that, hmm, handsomeness, there is the word to describe it. So my Ares is like, he, you'll notice he's, he's very buff. 
He's 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 got more of like like he's got a more creased face, very square jawed. Apollo is more of a sinuous and smooth character. He's got a bigger jaw in some ways, but it's just it's kind of like I was trying to parse the difference between handsome and beautiful. And then like Hermes is meant to embody like young male beauty. He's supposed to he manifests as younger than the other one. So he was supposed to be the epitome of like like somebody like in their teens maybe like the sort of. Uh, like the beautifulness of a young man then. And Zeus, I just figured, I mean, Zeus, he's just like, all he does is care about like getting people. So like, I figure he's gotta be good looking, right? Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Why is Artemis wearing a dress from Aslan's country? Um, that is something that is mentioned in multiple texts. She wears the dress of a young, like a young maiden. And they describe it, they will say that it's a dress that's above the knees. Like, that is specifically mentioned multiple places. And if you see artwork of her, she's almost always pictured that way too, where she has, um, I mean, sometimes they draw her as completely nude. I'm not gonna do that in Olympians. There goes the all ages rating. <laughs> but for the most part, she'll be wearing like this like short dress that comes up like somewhere between like just under her hips and above her knees. And that was specifically the way she dressed. You could find that in multiple sources. I'm curious what you would rather have her draw. I mean, aside from like running around in the nude, which would have been an option, but not for an all ages book, because they really, women especially wouldn't have worn anything other than a dress or a skirt back then. So I'm curious what else you thought, maybe like a loincloth? I don't know. Uh, let's see what else. Helen is the world famous beauty. What distinguishes her renowned beauty from Psyche's? Oh, this is interesting. We actually came up, uh, we actually talked about that because Psyche is described as being a particular beauty too, right? Um, I feel like this is just my own thoughts and this is actually going to, like I've mentioned, <laughs> I've got to stop saying that. I've created notes in the past for Eros and Psyche because they have been cut from other stories. So I think Helen is more of just like a very easy to identify standard of beauty. And I kind of mused upon this on Monday's episode that I feel like because she is a daughter of Zeus, that it's, there is a sort of, um, it's almost like a power. It's, it's akin to like the way uh, um, Aphrodite's beauty transcends like human levels. I feel like, like Helen verges on that. I feel like with Psyche, it had to have been a much more specific beauty in a way that like, so Eros chose her to be the woman that he was obsessed with. But for me, that means that Eros has a particular taste and that there is a specific, I wanted to draw her, her, na her name means like soul, right? And there's a very dreamy quality in like the story itself and the way Eros comes to her. So I wanted my drawings of her and I'll share them one of these days, uh, my designs, and they're not, finalized because I've changed some ideas about her since then but she had a very thoughtful and almost kind of ethereal quality whereas I feel Helen has a very physical quality I don't know if that makes sense but as guardian battle this is from Alicia Sophia as guardian battle royal who is in the final four okay <laughs> wow. all right so are we talking only as guardians are we talking the veneer are we talking Jotuns are we talk are we just talking like are we talking like the gods there. I mean, Odin's definitely going to be there. Thor's definitely going to be there. Um, don't know if Loki is. It's hard to say. Because, uh, I mean, A, are we counting him as an Asgardian? For the strength of my book, he will be. I almost feel like we have to put him there because uh, there's not a lot of, like, super famous, uh, like, you know, gods aside from that. Like, Balder might be there as long as nobody has any hemlock. Balder was so beloved that uh, everything in the, not hemlock, mistletoe, that everything in the universe agreed not to hurt him except for mistletoe. So Loki tricked another god to basically throw a piece of mistletoe at him. It hit him and it killed him. So that's a pretty big kryptonite, but otherwise it might make him pretty hard to be killed, right? Um, gosh, that's a hard one to figure out. I feel like if I really want to answer that, I would have to bring... No, oh, something else got knocked over. Um, I would have to bring in characters who are not specifically as guardians. Like, because I feel like Fenris the wolf, Fenrir the wolf would definitely be there. I feel like Jormungandr, the Midgard serpent, would be there. Hell, maybe, the goddess of the uh, dead, she might be there. It's hard to say. Now, that's a cool question, though. I like those sort of things. Um, <clears throat> uh, little Serial Draw asks... Uh, Athena has snakes, you know, all around her aegis, and an owl. 
Do you think she keeps frozen mice in the fridge, and how would the other gods react? Hmm. Which brings up the question, does Athena have a fridge? I choose to think... Okay, this is what I think. I think Athena's owl does its own hunting, and as a favor to the Aegis, it'll sometimes bring a couple extra mice. Because I don't think that... I don't... I mean... I know the thing with reptiles is they won't eat prey that's not moving. Like, you know, sometimes you see people drop like it and they have to like kind of nudge it. And I can't picture Athena like, come on, eat, eat my cape, eat. No, so I think, I, or maybe she like takes the ages off and it goes crawling off somewhere and eats some mice. Or, honestly, thinking about it, it's just like the front halves of the snakes. They don't seem to have digestive tracts. If they do, there must be like a tail hanging up the back and that's just a mess. So maybe they just don't eat. Maybe they just live off of her divine power. I don't know. That's a good question though. Um, fun fact, when I was an RA in school, a resident advisor, uh, one time some kids who were on my floor were really upset because they found out their roommate was keeping like halves of rats in the freezer. It was a really rough scene. Um, oh, CVQ Lama, I see a question, but it's in reference to something I didn't see. It just says, or Dionysus and Hestia. I'm not sure. Um... Ranka writes, I see some similarity between Greek myth and Japanese mythology. Have you thought about doing a Japanese myth book too? People ask me that a lot. Um, I feel like that would be... There's so much richness to Japanese mythology. I feel like I was able to write Greek mythology because it's something I've embraced all my life. And very much the culture I come out of, you know, the United States, we've literally fabricated, we've patterned our entire form of government and our culture on the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. So I felt like I had the right cultural background to do that. I feel if I were to do a book exploring Japanese mythology, I would give it it best, and I wouldn't intend to, I would give it a surface read because I come from a very different culture. And what I would want to see somebody do, somebody who was of Japanese you know, descent or of the culture, I would want to see them take, do that take, to kind of share one of the things I try to do with Olympians is to try to accurately reflect as much as I can what it must have been like to live in a world where these gods were real, where you believed in these gods. And I try to give a more nuanced display of the Olympian gods as a result. And I don't think I would have the knowledge to do uh, one for the Japanese gods. This is also one of the reasons, honestly, why I'd be hesitant to do Egyptian gods, just because I haven't spent as much time immersed in that culture. The two mythologies that I really read backwards and forwards a million times were Greek and Norse. So I'm doing those. And I'm not really sure I'm the guy to do the other ones. I hope that makes sense. I hope people understand. I should leave some other mythologies for other creators to do. Um, oh, Dionysus and his adventures to Hestia. That actually kind of works. However, I'll say this. Even though Hestia is the narrator, she doesn't even meet Dionysus until like the last three pages of the books. They don't really have adventures together per se. It's kind of Hestia's telling the story as a third person omniscient narrator, but that's a good idea for title. Were there gods of clouds besides Zeus? Yeah, there were. We actually mentioned, um, whose mother? Iris's mother was Electra, and she was literally a, not just a god of clouds, of a very specific type of clouds. She was the god of clouds that were colored amber or orange she, because like they like you know it was basically her dad was a god of the sea her mom was a god of the clouds and rainbows bridged the gap so yeah there were different gods for different sort of clouds either zeus was the all-encompassing god of the sky and just like poseidon was the all-encompassing god of the sea but there were many 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 minor gods of different variations of aspects of the sea aspects of the clouds aspects of the sky all things like this and you think about it, there's many gods for storms really so you have zeus right the cyclopes brontus steropus and argus their names mean flash of lightning thunderbolt and no thunder and lightning bolt like they are also storm gods typhon is a storm god monster like so they like you have like the one god who's the big boss zeus but then there were gods of clouds and such beyond that did i take any classes in college or general that helped you in art or writing or the books in general this is from little serial um yeah i went to a uh, school in um so okay first i should mention uh i spent my entire life drawing right it was something i worked at a lot i was very largely self-taught and sometimes when you're self-taught, you learn some bad lessons, but sometimes you learn some good lessons. I went to school, uh, an art school here in Brooklyn called the Pratt Institute. 
and I uh, learned how to redraw. I learned a lot of things. That's where you'll notice I draw very fast and very loose. Uh, that's one of the places I learned to do that. It was a really good way to capture details. It was the most important lesson I probably learned from there. And also while I was at the Pratt Institute, I did take courses in writing. And basically, um, I knew what I wanted to do. So I took courses in how to do illustration and courses in how to write. And at the same time, independent of my courses, I would write and draw too. Because it's important not just to keep make it be part of school. It has to become part of your life. It has to be something that you practice all the time, something you love. Because I'll be honest, it's, um, I say all the time, it's a cool job. It's the best job in the world for me. It's a lot of work. And it's really hard to break in. I've been very fortunate, knock on wood, but like not everybody gets to have this sort of life where this is the thing. And like it's something I work, like I work way more than 40 hours a week, but that's okay because I'm doing what I love. So just always spend your time writing and drawing if this is something you want to do. But yes, I did take courses. Uh, how do Eros and Aries get along? Uh, that's from Robes, <laughs> Robes Pieris. Uh, Robes Pierre's Ista 89. They get along really well. I mentioned this up front. Maybe you came a little bit later. Um, as she is the goddess of causing trouble and he's the god of bloodshed, uh, he seems to dig her, refers to as his sister. In fact, um, you can see it in my book, Ares, and that's actually a line taken from the Iliad. She's the one who rides his chariot into battle because, like, he's got this giant, like, knife covered chariot. There's no better place to cause trouble than behind a knife covered chariot. Um, besides Artemis and Apollo, do you draw any gods to resemble each other? I kind of, so, yeah, kind of. So um, there's a certain facial structure I gave to most of the Olympians that they almost all have. It's kind of, they have like a little bit of a crooked nose. I'll actually draw it real quick because I haven't drawn a picture yet. Um, <clears throat> almost all the Olympians have a nose like this. Like, if you just see that nose, I could be drawn Apollo, I could be drawn Zeus, I could be drawn Hades, could be drawn Poseidon, Ares, any of those dudes. Even Hera has a nose very similar to her, hers is a bit more slender. Um, I might actually draw Hades, because I haven't drawn him recently. And what's interesting about drawing Hades, you might not even realize it. My Hades, if he's not colored in, he looks an awful lot like Apollo. He's got a few differences. He's got his like kind of like weird goatee thing. He's a little bit heavier in the face. He, he, he manifests himself with a little bit more muscle and a little bit more heft than Apollo does. And his hair is normally colored in black, but I'm not gonna do it because as you can see, my marker's nearly killed. And then he's got the bigger muscles. But you can see facially, he looks a lot like Apollo. And I kind of did this because I thought they are a family. They should resemble each other, even though, I, as I've established many other times, they're genetically, they're not related because they're not human. They don't have genes, right? So they, they, but I liked the idea that there was a familial resemblance that they carry amongst each other. So in a sense, almost all of the gods and goddesses do look similar. Um, some of them vary at different degrees beyond that. Um, what inspired you? This is from Lili Safadi. Man. So much. That's like something I could spend an entire time. I mentioned before, in third grade, I was first introduced to the Greek gods, which was a huge inspiration. But like just off the top of my head, some of the big influences in my life. So one of the reasons I was so primed to like the Greek gods, I almost said geek gods, uh, I was really into He-Man and the Masters of the Universe as a kid. I still am. Google a picture of me online. I'm probably in front of my wall of Masters of the Universe figures. I love them. I wear He-Man shirts in here a lot, too. Um, so that was something that was huge. Um, the Clash of the Titans movie came out when I was a little kid. That was like huge for me too. Then there was like different comics and stuff. You could see right back here, it's kind of covered. There's Calvin and Hobbes. Like Calvin and Hobbes was huge for me. It was a comic strip. Before I even really got into comics the way I am now, I was like super into Calvin and Hobbes. Then there was different com like comics and things. Like the Mighty Thor from Marvel Comics was a huge inspiration. And talking just about Greek mythology, I mention this all the time. Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths was like, I love it. I love Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths so much. I did a comic for the New York Times about it, how much I love New Dallaire's Book of New York, uh, uh, <laughs> Dallaire's Book of New York Times, Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths. There's so many things. And I just, I forget sometimes and things just come out. Or people look at my work and they'll point something out. They're like, oh, you clearly look at this art. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. Like, it's just, you constantly have to feed your brain new things and these things come out in different ways you can never even tell. Uh, do I speak or read ancient Greek? 
uh, from Ian Lendler. Oh, hi, Ian. I do not, unfortunately. I can identify a lot of the roots, especially if it's been translated to English, but the Cyrillic alphabet is a mystery to me. There's a few letters I can read here and there, but for, oh, for the most part, no. I can just kind of see the root words and I can kind of tell what a word is maybe, like a name is, that's about the extent of it. So unfortunately, I am reliant on other people's translations. So a lot of times when I read a story, like say if I read the Odyssey, I'll try to read more than one translation because translation is actually kind of like an inaccurate term. These, they don't, it's not like a code. It's not like it matches directly. Whoever the translator is, like kind of takes their own spin. Just like I always talk about, a storyteller has to give their own spin to things. The translators will do the same. So there was actually a bit, I don't remember what specifically it was, there was a line I really loved in one translation of the Iliad that I wanted to make a reference to in my book, Hephaestos. And it turns out, it seemed like that was something that that translator came up with himself because I read two other versions and there was nothing even close to it. And they even have like the lines listed. I'm like, oh, they kind of spent, so it was actually something I ended up cutting out of like an early draft because it didn't really, I, I couldn't justify it for that one translation. Um, would you, CVQ Lama ask, would you ever make an original idea that would have in, uh, my own in, in superstitions of Greek mythology, like my own inspirations. I, I used to say no, but I, I do think about it a lot recently. Like the idea, especially as I'm, I've written the last Olympians book, I'm drawing it now. So Olympians as a chapter of my life is nearly closed, at least of me creating. I've mentioned many times my intention to come back and do more stories, but it might be kind of a cool idea to do something that's not retelling the original myths, something playing with the myths, but taking it into a new direction. And I've been writing a lot of notes along those lines. So we'll see if they come to fruition, but it's been pretty exciting and it's what I've been spending a lot of my creative energies on right now. Have I been to Greece for inspiration? Yes, spent many months traveling around Greece, seeing all the sites. I felt it was very important to do that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, a friend of mine gives pushback about your Artemis being blonde. Have you ever gotten this critique? I probably get more people <laughs> commenting about that than any other of my designs. And, okay, I think I've mentioned this elsewhere, but on the Artemis episode, but, um, and the Apollo episode too. Um, I wanted Artemis and Apollo to have the same look and giving her black hair kind of, which kind of makes sense if you do the opposite things, made them not look very similar at all. But the way the color design I came up with, Apollo is colored always, like he's in the bright day sun. He has very rich tones, very warm color. His skin is very dark. His hair is a golden brown. Whereas Artemis, as kind of his opposite number, and even though it's not her primary function, being the goddess of the moon, it's one of the things people associate with her most. And she certainly seems to be a much more nocturnal being than her brother. Artemis is always colored like she's in moonlight. She has very pale, translucent skin, and her hair is kind of, it's, it's, it's not golden. It's like a, a soft, almost not even lemon, just a soft yellow. It's a moonlight yellow. And that was to kind of show the opposite numbers of there. A lot of my goddesses already were brunettes or black hair, so I'm like, I felt we could break up with that. But it is interesting, people do, I think the, um, the collective idea of in the universe of what color hair Artemis has must be black because people call him that. Um, would you ever consider drawing the Olympians, this is from Australis 19, in Mycenaean or Minoan fashion? It's very funny you ask that because there's actually, I really haven't done much of that. When I was a kid, I appreciate it now, but I remember looking at books where they had a Greek mythology book where an artist tried to draw it in like a faux ancient Greek style. I always found that to be very uninteresting. That being said, there are a couple of scenes in Dionysus. There's a scene where we see some of the, we see a story drawn, a very quick story drawn Minoan style. And there's a story where we see a, we see a, there's a, oh, there's a story drawn in ancient Greek vase painting style. And I really haven't done that yet. There's been little hints maybe here and there and stuff, but I'm doing this just to kind of show Dionysus has such a wide 
selection of myths and some of them are so odd and I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a cultural backdrop for some of them and it occurred to me a really great way to do that would be to render them within the framework of a story drawn in a more typical Olympian style to show something that reflected the original cultural like artworks. Ranka mentioned she's Japanese. Ranka, I would love to see you try to do the Japanese myths. And Lily Safadi is Lebanese. That's awesome. Maybe you should, I mean, this is the thing, I would love to see people take the, the myths of their native cultures or their, their native, um, the people they're like, you know, the ethnic groups they belong to traditionally and do stories about them. That'd be great. Oh man. Team Aki asks, Artemis is so aloof. Who are her friends on Olympus? Apollo, Leto. I think, I, I, I feel pretty strongly, like I think she is aloof. I think she has a little bit of a hard time relating to the other gods. Um, Hera mentions in Apollo, no, in Artemis, Hera actually says how the three of them, Apollo, Artemis, and Leto, form a weird little clique within the family of Olympus. Like they're, they're on Olympus, they're Zeus's kids, but they, the three of them have their own little thing going off to the side. And Hera mentions how much it annoys her. It's like, she's like, why are they not assimilating with the rest of us? And we know there's some good reasons, Hera. Maybe you shouldn't have chased their mom with a giant snake for two years. But um, I don't think that Artemis has a lot of friends on Olympus. She has her retinue. She set that up. She has people there that are her friends. And I think she's able to be civil and to be a little bit of a peacemaker where needed. But weirdly, her brother Apollo, who definitely has the bigger personality defects, we see stories where he hangs out with Hermes, where he hangs out with Athena. He actually does seem to have friends outside of that group. But Artemis does seem to keep to herself. I do, I hearken up to the fact that she, uh, I chalked it up to the fact that she knew from a very young age what she wanted to do and she has stuck to it. She's persistent, that one. She's very, um, very stubborn, for lack of a better term. And she's stuck to it. And so the other, she has a very uncompromising and unyielding view of how she wants things to be. And so the other gods and goddesses, just by necessity of their different domains, can't match up to that. So she just kind of keeps to herself. Um, hmm. Can you explain the difference between dryads and naiads? It's confusing for me. <sighs> Boy. So I believe dryads are more, I, I knew I was gonna be stumped at least once today. Naiads are definitely nymphs of the sea. I feel like dryads are nymphs more closely related to trees. Maybe somebody who has access to Google can double check that for me. I'm not 100% sure on that one. Take that answer with a grain of salt. Uh, oh, CVQ had an, oh, that, oh, she's referring to that, okay. Ah, someone already answered it. Dryads are earth spirits and naiads are water spirits. That was pretty close. Uh, what is your main key that you want the readers to learn from your work? Oh, wow. Okay. I think, I think it is, I want them to read Olympians and to get a feel for what it would be like to live in a world where these were real, where the gods and goddesses were real and around you and all the natural phenomena and all the things that you observed in the world and all, not even natural phenomena, like the relations to people, everything had some sort of divine force that wasn't maybe controlling it, but was influenced by it, was part of it, was suffused with it. To see the world around you where there were these beings, be they Olympians or be they dryads and naiads or whatever, that there was this touch of this divinity that was there within it like the awe that that would create. But also at the same time, the way that it would give you, uh, that there, there, there was something so personable about it, that the Olympians, they were just a big giant dysfunctional family. Like these gods, they weren't aloof, they weren't perfect. They could do anything, but they were like you or me or anyone else. Like I wanted that feeling to get across. And I wanted people to see the gods in their, in their imperfections and also the wide breath of all the things they were gods of. It kills me when somebody's just like, Hermes is the god, is the messenger god. I'm like, yeah, he is, but he's a million other things. All of them had so many different facets to their personalities and their functions and their roles in society and the way people viewed them and worshiped them that I want to get that out there. I want it to feel, I want to recapture 
a glimpse of this disappeared way of life. So people can read it, and then when they encounter myths elsewhere, they have this grounding that they can fill in the gaps and understand how it must have been when these were your gods. Um, where did I learn about the specifics of all the gods? Well, everywhere. It's a constant thing. There's like a, mil a great source to start. There is a website called theoi.com and it lists different gods by their names and different types. It doesn't have everybody. It's a good source to start. But what it's really nice is it mentions the, the stories where they appear in, and then you could go to the library or online. A lot of these texts are actually available online and read all the myths that say, like, this minor, like, I want to read all the appearances of Antiope. You could go there and find where Antiope is mentioned and then read all these stories online or in the library. I have a wad of books that I use as these things. It's, it's an ongoing thing. I'll probably spend the rest of my life reading about Greek mythology, and I'll probably still keep finding new stories. Every time I do one of these books, I've, and I've read so many books of Greek mythology, I find new stories I never knew before. Um, do you like to draw modern clothing or ancient Greek clothing? Which one is harder? Um, ancient Greek clothing, the way I draw it, I'll be honest, because I'm drawing a mythic time, I simplify it. I draw very, it's, um, if we lived in a different sort of society, if we still believe in these gods, right? The Olympians would probably be drawn, many of them, in the nude. It's just the way that the Greeks have viewed them. I probably would have done that. I give them minimal clothing in those instances. Some of the goddesses in particular had more ornate outfits. I try to reflect that. Um, there's something very fun about drawing uh, the ancient Greek clothing, especially the simplified way I've done it, because I am essentially drawing nude figures in motion. It's very dynamic looking. Modern clothing is, in a sense, easier because I see it every day. I'm wearing modern clothing right now. So it's very easy to draw that, but it doesn't billow and fold and have all the great wrinkles that can like influence shapes of like and movements the way the ancient Greek stuff does. Um, it's weird. I definitely spend more time drawing ancient clothes than I do modern clothes. So if I draw something with like modern clothes, I mean like I'm kind of, it, it feels it will feel sometimes like tight and constrained almost. Uh, let's see. Would I ever make a series outside of mythology? Yeah, I, I mean, I have. Um, I, 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 I draw a series called Captain Awesome and another one called Super Turbo. They're both about like modern day stuff. Like Captain Awesome's a little boy who pretends he's a superhero. Uh, Super Turbo is a hamster who thinks he's a superhero. I have other things I'm working on. There's like a middle grade series, a kind of a spooky one that's set in the modern day. I am, I do want to do other stuff in the mythology. Um, the Greek mythology takes up a lot of time, but now that's at an end, I have a ton of projects that are coming down the pike, and you'll see a lot of these things getting announced as time goes on. Um, why is Poseidon's skin blue? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I made his skin blue. It, uh, hmm, I don't really have a super good reason for that. Hades has the chalk white skin because he's underground all the time. Hera has very light skin because one of her cult titles, they would mention she had very white arms. They said she looked like a mar marble statue. So I'm like, okay, she has light skin. Demeter, I actually made a little bit darker skin. She's still quite pale, but she actually sees some sun. Zeus's skin is determined because he, worship of him originated. He was created in the Caucasus Mountains, which is where you get the term Caucasian for like white people from, right? Um, who else am I forgetting? Hestia, you guys haven't seen her skin yet. You'll see that in Dionysus, but she's on fire all the time. And Poseidon, I gave him the blue skin because as the god of the sea, there was specific mentions I found in Greek texts about the fact that his hair looked like seaweed. And so I thought, okay, if he has hair that literally is green and like kind of slimy and stuff, like it would look weird on just like a normal human skin tone. So I gave him kind of like a bluish skin tone to kind of reflect the sea, the sea that he's a part of, that he embodies. I hope that makes sense. Um... Some, a bunch of people were dressed, introduced to Greek stuff in third grade. That's really cool. Um, how long does it take you to research each book? I answered that one already, but how long does it take to write or to draw? Okay, depends. So the research can go anywhere from months to years, but I'm often doing other things at the same time. As far as drawing the layouts of the book, figuring out what's going to go on each page, that could take a long time. But to actually sit down, once I have the layouts worked out, and to draw a book, 
I can draw two finished pages of Olympian's artwork that you see in the book in about a day. So I can normally have the entire book drawn in about two months. Once I have everything worked out, the working out process, laying everything out, that could take a lot longer. <laughs> Inspired almost uh, by my shirt, did the Greeks have any monster myths that resemble Bigfoot? Not so much the Greeks, but have you ever heard the history of gorillas? So gorillas were something that people in the West, meaning you know me and other folks like me in the United States and other parts of the world, uh, didn't know about gorillas until like, like really the late 1800s, right? However, there was this uh, Carthaginian trader named Hanno the Navigator. He was a contemporary of ancient Greece who mentioned seeing these giant hairy men most of whom were women. Um, it was a, she saw a troop of gorillas and recorded this. And the word gorilla comes from this. And it was always regarded as a mythological beast. So like, oh, that's weird, these hairy things. And then like in like the late 1800s, uh, I forget who, some guy finally killed a gorilla and brought it to the West. Everyone's like, holy cow, these giant hairy people. So if you count Hanno the Navigator, a Greek contemporary who moved in the Greek world, as telling the stories of real life gorillas as something similar to Bigfoot? Yeah, yeah, they did have stories like Bigfoot. Also, there was that dude, man, what did they call him? There was the one mythological group of people, you see them in Hermes, who actually, like, they were believed to, like, lay on their back all day and hold their one giant foot up as an umbrella to block the sun. That's not the way we typical think of Bigfoot, but it's certainly, they had big feet. Uh, let's see, we are almost, uh, Oh, we're almost done here. Uh, we're down to the last few minutes. Let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, which book of yours are, the most, are you the most proud of? Uh, it's probably Hera, um, because I've said this before, but it always bears repeating. Uh, I'm more comfortable in my drawing than my writing. I had an idea for the story of Hera. I didn't honestly know if I was a good enough writer to pull off. And it was very hard, but I did it. I felt like I nailed the story, if I may say so myself, and I always feel very proud of it. In recent years, I've also gotten very proud of Poseidon, because Poseidon was the hardest book for me to write. And people have told me they find Poseidon to be my favorite book, and I've read it a few times, I'm like, eh, it's pretty good. So I'm pretty, I'm really proud of all my books. There hasn't been one yet that I'm like, that one stinks. That'll be a very sad day when I do that one. Um, Aslan's country hypothesizes maybe Artemis is friends with Athena. They do have a lot in common. I agree. I could kind of see that happening. I feel like if there's anyone on Olympus that Artemis would get along with, it would probably be Athena. Do I ever have any alternate designs for Hestia? Yeah, you're going to see some of them. You're going to see Hestia when she's not on flame. And honestly, the way I'm drawing Hestia in Dionysus is a bit different than you've seen her to this point. A lot of times when a goddess or god in my books takes center stage, where they're the main character. And Hestia is definitely one of two main characters in Dionysus. Um, my design for them changes because I'm drawing them so much more. And there's a lot more detail in Hestia now than you've ever seen before. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that you're seeing a lot more of her personality than you've ever seen before. So there have been some different designs. And I have old designs where she's just like, you know, you, any, you read any description of Hestia. She has a pensive appearance, sometimes wears a shroud. Yeah, I drew stuff like that. but. Those weren't very exciting. We are down to the last two minutes. Let's see if we have any last questions. Would I ever make an episode on altar designs for Olympians? That's a very interesting idea. I think I would have to do some research going through my old sketchbooks to find some of them. I would, and that would be a different sort of episode. It wouldn't make, it wouldn't make as much sense to do a, a live one as maybe something that I just kind of talked over. And on. I'll, I'll have to think about that. That's an interesting idea, CVQ Lama. I might do that one. <laughs> I did hair up proud. Thank you. Um, have you ever considered teaming up the Olympians and creating Crafty Mario? I was about to say, before I said, this is my studio mate, Dean Haspiel. He has been after me for the longest time to do an Avengers-type story of the event of the Olympians, or in the modern day where they team up and they fight against a great force of evil. I was about to say, before I saw it was him, I'm like, oh yeah, my, my, one of my studio mates is after me. Yeah, I have considered it. Maybe I'll do it. Uh, yeah, he, I'm sorry. No more drawing today, because I, I, I went too far. I didn't... I didn't, I, uh, like, we see the one picture, the kind of weird looking Hades. Next time I do one of these, uh, I'll definitely spend more time drawing. You just all had so many great questions. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I'll be back Friday, unless the world throws some weird curveballs. I'm not sure what I'm doing. If you have any suggestions, 
Maybe I'll do another Q&A. Who knows? Because this was very successful. But if you have any uh, suggestions, please send it to my email at georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. Uh, you can always catch old episodes or watch the ones again on my YouTube, youtube.com slash user slash George Olympians. And thank you all so much for tuning in. And um, I'll see you all on Friday. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.